Hey guys, my name is Volus C. Hope that you are doing well. In this video, we're going to be talking all about the Dwegum. This is a faction you can play in Conquest, the Last Argument of Kings. It is the Dwarfs faction. To give you some background, I guess, if you think about Tolkien and Lord of the Rings, The Hobbit, The Dwarfs, that is something that really put them into pop culture, especially the fantasy genre. Everybody understands the dwarfs to be these people who live in mountains and hoard gold and fight with hammers and axes and the very stubborn and staunch and tough. And then when Games Workshop uh, brought out their version of Tolkien's dwarves, of course, they warhammerized it a little bit and made them these beer drinking sort of grudge holding kind of characters that live in mountains and and hate the elves. One little innovation I think Games Workshop really came up with was the Chaos Dwarfs, where if you've got, you know, the desire to branch out and have all these different factions under the sun, and the Chaos Dwarfs were a like a, like a sub-faction of the dwarves that apparently sort of wandered out into the Chaos Wastes, and just uh, in a time of desperation and... Um, uh, I guess turmoil and a lot of a uh, really a crisis. They um, turned to chaos, or at least uh, turned away from the from the good guys path, and um, that meant they wound up being spellcasters and actually having uh, mythical creatures, which is not something you have with the the like the the good guys, the lawful um, lawful good dwarves, if I could put it that way. Where um, in in Warhammer, the dwarves uh, just hated magic; they didn't use it. They have these runes instead, etc. Etc. They build, they build, um, you know, shotguns and they fly gyrocopters, but the Chaos Dwarves did use magic and they did ride on sort of mythical flappy wing beasts. And in Conquest, I guess the innovation is that they've sort of brought those two sort of back together, and now you have Dwegum as you know the hardy warriors that uh, are very tough but slow and very stubborn and don't run away easily, and they're, they're very much a static gun line kind of army. But you do actually have the beasts like the Hellbringer Drake and the ironclad drakes and of course they do make these um, really insane sort of mechanical contraptions like the inferno automata and the steel forged I do also think of what Bethesda did with the Elder Scrolls, where you have the Dwemer, which uh, interestingly were not a race that you encounter in game but they are sort of like um, a long forgotten sort of extinct race or maybe they're hiding somewhere and you're finding the machinery that they came up with and perhaps that's been an influence on what um, Conquest has done here. Now in terms of gameplay, uh, Dwegum were the absolute number one dominating uh, faction for probably over a year and they've had multiple nerfs recently but they're still in a bit of an awkward place really because um, compared to all of the other factions, the design is not the best. Um, I'll talk about that a bit more in, in the video. But they're still kind of a lovable faction, and I actually play them as one of my main two factions. What I really like about them is that they are strike a very good contrast from, from other people's factions. You know, they are, they're very distinct and different, I think, in the way that they play from what everybody else is doing. Some of the miniatures I find uh, really appealing, and they give me an opportunity to, to paint in a very different way. I like that too. And I'm, I am attracted to the idea that you can have these really robust, uh, like, defensive infantry blocks, but you can still access some other stuff if you want to, and the spells are very straightforward powerful and devastating they are a very strong faction so if you are really more interested in uh, like doing well on the tabletop easily as opposed to um, you know the the um, the mechanical how can I put it the um, I'm really not too sure what I, what I wanted to make uh, say with that point but I feel like you guys get the gist anyhow in this video <laughs> we're going to be um, talking about all of the characters and all of the abilities and all of the regiments. So stick with me if you want to learn about Dwegum. I've been playing a lot of Dwegum and um, have plenty to say about them. So why don't I just um, minimize my little face here and we'll put me down in the corner. And we'll start going through it, shall we? So, Dwegum have unfortunately only four characters. This is disappointing. I really feel like that they are the one faction that need more of them. Um, even when you look at um, some of the other factions that only have a few characters, like um, 
uh, Woodrun, for example, they can still have the option to sort of put some of their characters on things. I guess that could be said of Dwegum as well, where um, the Rag, Sorcerer, and Steel Shaper can all ride uh, large monsters, and that sort of makes them a little bit different. But still, I do feel like with this being one of the older factions, they could do with um, a, a buff before other factions get buffs, really, in terms of, well, not buffs in terms of the power level, but an expansion, I should say, where you have a, another character that, that plays differently. So let's just go through them one by one. Um, I don't care awake. In fact, before we just touch on that, I'll just very briefly mention that I'm not going to talk in detail about the actual rules here. I'll, I'll leave it to you guys to read it. But one pr one problem with the overall faction global rules is that, first of all, this pursuit of arm... Um, I don't know how you, you know, pronounce that, but it's all about having your um, command stands of your infantry being able to duel enemy characters, but it says refusing the duel does not confer the usual negative effects. This is disappointing because if your opponent has something to lose from accepting a duel, they just simply decline it and nothing happens. But if they have a tooled up combat character that's going to kill your command stand, then you would never bother dueling them in the first place. So this entire bit of rules here, just completely irrelevant, really. People just don't use that in their games, which is it's, it's a shameful. It needs to be fixed, needs to be updated. The Dwegum Creeds uh, depend on whether you take an Ardent Carraweg or a Steel Shaper or a Tempered Sorcerer, which means that if you take the Rag as your Warlord, you miss out on these Creeds, which is terrible. We'll get to that when we talk about the Rag later. Elemental Potency is the most powerful faction ability in the game. Um, debate me if you don't agree with that, but it's uh, only accessible if you actually use the Tempered Sorcerer or the Steel Shaper, which means that almost everybody uses one of those two characters as their Warlord. Lord, it does get a bit boring but what it what it allows you to do is every time you cast a spell and you've got a lot of characters casting a lot of spells you get one of these tokens which can be used to um, pass automatically at a fence roll or an attack roll um, or a morale check so long as the regiment doing that is with an eight of your um, your sorcerer or your steel shaper you can use maximum of five it used to be like unlimited but uh, what makes this really really powerful is that you can wait for that absolutely clutch combat where your opponent is you know expecting to wipe something out or at least do crippling damage and you turn that into an attack that doesn't really succeed in that and you know this is just like a, a no-brainer sort of thing when it comes up you just spend the tokens your opponent fails in their 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 attempt and you're at an advantage but also it um it often um deters people from making plays that they otherwise would allowing you to shut down quite a lot of the things that your, your fact would normally be facing giving you more time to do shooting and of course pump up the spells the alternative here the Ardent Creed it's becoming a little bit more viable but it's still not great because just relative to the extreme power of elemental potency it just doesn't quite cut the mustard all you really get from it is like a free auto rally um for your for your regiments that is it says triggered once per battle for each regiment it's um it's useful let me say that and uh, by taking the ardent carraway which we'll talk about first um you can have this thing which is the supremacy ability which gives all of your command stands plus two attacks and um, plus two charge distance when the enemy is in range of an objective zone. So really, the only way to not use um, Tempered Creed, really, is to take this guy and take a lot of flame, flame Berserkers and take stuff that would really be doing well with the plus two bonus to command stance. So you take a lot of like fast um, combat units like these, then maybe you add the Rag as your second one. No point taking this, the, the, this, the Sorcerers and stuff. Well, you could, I guess. It's just that you're not gener generating any tokens with them then the raid can grab some initiates grab um, a couple of iron clad drakes or something and um, away you go so this is the kind of list that you might build if you're um, running that sort of um, like uh, righteous annihilation build with the Carowig, right with um, ardent creed but most wiggum lists you're going to see are of the spell casting variety but let's just talk about this guy. So let's say you do decide to go for Ardent uh, Creed and you make him the Warlord. This is one way to play him. Um, bear in mind that this character um, is still quite a good character because you're going to be using him as a supporting character in uh, lists where the um, the Steel Shaper or the Sorcerer is the Warlord. It's just that this is one of the, the, the fallback characters. He is the one character that allows you to take Flame Berserkers, which are quite good. They are light infantry, which means they get on the board straight away. They're very fast 
fast with movement six and um, with resolve five they're amazing against old dominion um, carries right so the carries are just using their insanity spell you're taking defense rolls on your resolve check your resolve five they're excellent in that kind of situation and most other light units in the game these guys are going to beat up on them in close combat um, most of the time right the good thing about them right now is that the Kerouig has this new uh, spell called Rancor, which means that a friendly infantry regiment has its command stand counting as plus two stands for the purposes of seizing zones. So um, light units can't score, they cannot seize at all, but the ruling has been made by Parabellum, like this has been documented, that if you cast Rancor, uh, although you have three light units, three light stands here, three stands which can't score, you go from having zero scoring stands to plus two, which gives you two scoring stands. So the Berserkers the double march, and then the next turn um, they march again onto the zone, or maybe if you have a zone right next to your side of the board on some missions, you march them up, and the Kerouig may already be in the unit of Flame Berserkers, so the next card you draw is the Ardent Kerouig. He then casts Rancor, and you start scoring very, 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 very early, which is um, a really cool thing about Berserkers, right? In terms of abilities and things, what you might be wanting to use here is this thing here. Uh, sorry, under Masteries, um, his special one is Flaming Oratory. This is Kerouig only, so it just gives them Tenacious. Now, other factions have plenty of ways of getting Tenacious. Dwegum have to pay a fair bit for it, and it's because it's so powerful on Dwegum. When you have good resolve and good defense and certain things which can block damage, like, of course, um, the elemental potency, you know, this kind of ability is at a premium. But if you're running the Ardent Kerouac in a group of Flame Berserkers or Initiates, which is my other preferred way of using them, then uh, this is a very, very uh, useful ability, even for 30 points, right? So you've got a few other spells here. Dismay, minus one resolve. That is relevant, okay? So if you're up against something which has a reasonably low um, defense, maybe high resolve, and you're about to um, bash them with your Flame Berserkers, Ardent Kerouig activates first, cast Dismay on the enemy unit, then Chains activates into the um, their Flame Berserkers. And I say Chains, just for newer players, what you're allowed to do is you draw your character card, resolve your character card, and then if your next card in your stack is the regiment that the character is part of, you can activate it straight away. So in that sense, you can um, drop the resolve of the enemy regiment before you, um, you start dealing damage to them. So this one uh, loses broken status as if it's used to rally. Um, again, this is a, a little bit silly because you've got a bit of a, a double up with Ardent uh, Creed. So if you are happening to run Ardent Creed, well, your, your units are going to be uh, rallying anyway. So casting Resolve is not going to come up very much. I would kind of like to see something a little bit different. Gaining Inspired until the end of the round. Again, you can, in, in most cases, Inspire as an action or just charge. So Resolve is just not used very much at all. Fear is very useful, so your opponent may be completely relying on um, getting points from um, holding a zone. If you happen to be nearby and you can cast this on them, this can be big. If you're playing a scenario like melee where your opponent might have um, some, something camped on the smaller zone for plus two points, one of the bigger zones for plus three points, you get, um, you get plus two for having two zones at once, so they stand to get seven points there. This could shut down the scoring on that larger zone and drop them from instead of scoring seven objective points to just two. So this is, is quite a relevant spell. And of course, Rancor, we talked about, very useful for early scoring. This character used to be a very weak character. and Par Parabellum has buffed him up to a point where he's quite usable. And uh, I really commend them for that. As much as I uh, criticize them for, for not doing certain things, they are showing us they're going in a really good direction with it. He is the one spellcaster that is kind of useful in close combat, as you can see from the stats. Clash 3, attacks 5, not bad. Um, he could be a bit better. I very rarely uh, give him any of the uh, the combat weapons. This is really more for the whole rag. In terms of, of gear, uh, sometimes you might want to give him Memory of Death if he is going to be in with the uh, Flame Berserkers, or if he's going to be in the Initiates, you could uh, consider. Uh, I, I suppose, I mean... This isn't great, but yeah, um, I would probably go for uh, either just no items at all or maybe something defensive. This one here is interesting. Um, flawless Strikes, that could be quite good on the Berserkers because they have a high number of attacks. 
So if he is in with the Berserkers, you're doing 19 attacks from the unit. And if you are running Arden Krieg, that's, you know, 21 attacks. So when you have that many attacks, Floor Strikes does become quite useful. There was another spell that I wanted to briefly mention. Um, I can't remember which one it is. There is one uh, spell you can get where... Ah, uh, yes, this one here. All command stands get plus one to their attack. If your entire build is based around um, having more attacks than the command stands and doing well with that, for example, if he has Righteous Annihilation because he's the Warlord, that's not a bad uh, choice, really. Uh, because you're just really sort of trying to go all in on your character stand, command stands doing damage, so that can be quite a good one. So those are a few little options there. With Dwegum, again, I don't, I don't like most of the choices. Uh, they're all kind of interesting, but a lot of them have to do with just making you better in duels. Dueling is just not very useful at the moment, um, and uh, some of these are more for the offensive spells side of things or very, very large regiments. So I typically just keep it to Flaming or Oratory, maybe a little bit of um, Aura of Death. And, uh, and that's about it. Focus, not really. He, uh, I think he just gets a bonus for devout for stuff as well. So, for example, because he's a priest, if he is in the Flame Berserkers and he casts Rancor on them, that's going to go off automatically. So he doesn't necessarily need focused. And with the update to retinues going away, um, this guy's priest sex automatically without any upgrades. So it's pretty reliable. So that, in a nutshell, is the Ardent Kerouig. Let us go now to the Holdrag. So the whole rag is is a useful character. He he is uh, viable, but um, out of the four characters, he is by far the worst option for being your warlord. Which is sad because he's kind of like the iconic, you know, ruling class character, and you'd expect him to be a warlord in some lists. But there are a couple of reasons why you shouldn't use this guy as your warlord. Reason number one is that he doesn't allow you access to either of the creeds. So you can't have the amazing Tempered Creed and you can't have the, you know, quite useful Ardent Creed at all. He just doesn't allow that at all because of the army rules, which is a shame. The second reason, and this compounds on the first, is that his supremacy ability just doesn't give you enough of an advantage relative to what the other characters can do. So... He really just allows you to sort of be stubborn and hold a zone and always seize it and just you camp there. The thing is, in the long run, you, you're trying to win the game. You're trying to beat up on your opponent and kill their regiments and have more of your stuff on on, on, on the zones. And that's easier to do if, you, if you're if you actually winning on attrition. And this, this ability doesn't really forward and advance that sort of effort at all. Then you look at what the other characters can do. For example, a sorcerer pumping out two spells a turn. That certainly does you know increase your chances of actually winning the arm wrestle of the of the mid game whereas this is something where a lot of turns you're just you're going to be the one scoring anyway because you've committed your whole reg and your regiment to that that zone your opponent might just choose to ignore ignore you and you're not making any progress so it is kind of sad furthermore if you want to ride the beautiful ironclad drake and the reg is the only person that can ride it you've got to make him your warlord so you take this 25 point vergon reg thing it's the warlord only which is a shame yes you get a few little buffs but it really just isn't worth it it's it's really something which is a need of um a, a, an overhaul i would say now um having said all of that is the the reg uh good is he useful um i would actually say yes uh because uh, what you can do is you can take him in the context of a um, uh, elemental list, like a Tempered Creed list, and just run him as a character that you know sits in a group of initiates. These guys are very tough, but they're also very cheap, and that allows you to take a Ironclad Drake, which does not have a rider, and this is suddenly a very good warband. So then you go over here, you grab your Sorcerer, you grab your, your normal things that you're going to take, and uh, this starts to become a really sort of viable list now, right? So the Rag is the um, the main combat character. He is more of a duelist. Um, let's see what this says. Uh, so a Thane's regiment gets flank. We'll talk about the Thane's a little bit later. Starts with Cleave 1. You can tool this guy to be a real beat stick. So you take Dragobrod, which is 40 points, but worth it. If it's going to be on the Rag, it's not really worth it on the other characters, in my opinion. If you're going to be doing that, you want to go and take this thing, which is fueled by the furnace, which means that he gets relentless blows. So the whole point of this is that you're making five attacks, 
and uh, any rolls of a one will be an additional hit and uh, a lot of hits are going to be gained with clash four naturally and it's going to be cleave three because your init initiates don't have any cleave and the rake's just going to be sitting in them then um, over a period of time with you trying to duel your opponent and then them declining and just uh, continuing to attack he is really what's doing the unit's damage and the unit's not going to die very quickly because your sorcerer is generating those tokens which can be spent to auto pass defense rolls if these guys are up against something like like um, a Hephaestion, which is uh, Cleave 3. Well, they have Defense 3 and Shield, so they're going to drop down to Defense 1, but you can spend the tokens to auto-pass those Defense rolls. They're very, very helpful. Let's say you get charged by something like a Stratagos that is mounted with 5 Cataphractoi on the Supremacy turn, so he's got plus to Brutal and plus Impact hits, and they've got all of that. Let's say they even have a Line Breaker. They come in, they're reducing you to Defense 1, and they've got the, the hit Tyros there to get another round of attacks if they break you. If that happens, they might get, um, I don't know, 10 hits if they're really lucky and you can just block you know four or five of them with your uh, po uh, your tokens then you fail another bunch of them you might lose one stand and then you, you fail a few resolve checks and then you're fine and then when it's your time to attack the rag just chomps like one stand of, of of guys and then you move and you start shooting them with your fire forge it's just such a great block it's so defensive and it's so important if you're running the classic dwegum and most powerful uh, dwegum build which is the you know the gun line that has one or two anchor anvil type units in there right so that's the way that the rag works looking a bit more closely at his warband you can take the the the, the basic ballista and the basic hold warriors they're not great they're good mainstays to unlock other stuff the thanes are kind of an iconic look, look but unfortunately they are a little bit um over costed right now so he does uh, allow them to have flank, so they come on automatically on turn three. Great, they are not particularly fast. They don't have Vanguard, they're just movement five. They are expensive. The best thing about them, of course, is that they're very tough. They've got five wounds, uh, defense three with the shield, hard and one. That is very tough. Uh, in terms of the upgrades, you can give them one of these guys. They can even go up to Harden 2. Uh, they could be a little anchor here that allows the, 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 the fire sorcerer to shoot directly into combat with their opponent. And, of course, the Ore of Death if you're going for the Magma Sorcerer build. So they, they, do, they do work. They do stuff, but uh, they are expensive. You want to take a big unit, you're sort of starting to break the bank there. So Thanes are in need of a little bit of a buff. Over here, uh, Dragon Slayers, we'll talk about them um, just very briefly. They are also need a little bit of a buff because if you look at this, you, you're paying 220 for the Dragon Slayers and 220 for the Ironclad Drake. Let's compare them. So the, the Drake, much faster, movement seven, uh, obviously getting around the board much, much more quickly. Uh, the Dragon Slayers are a little bit better with the Clash and they have Cleave three. That is a little bit better than the Drake at Cleave three with only Cleave two. So these guys have Cleave three, as you can see there, right? So a wound 17 for the Drake, and for these guys it's 18, so the Drake is slightly worse on that department. But the thing is, though, that once you lose a stand of Dragon Slayers, they're losing some of their attacks. So these guys have uh, 16 attacks with the leader, this has 12 attacks with Relentless Blows, which is sort of comparable, but as soon as you start losing any Dragon Slayers, um, you lose the attacks, with the, whereas the Drake stays with those attacks all the way through. These guys have Defense 3, Harden 2, this has straight up Defense 3 and Evasion 2, so that's quite nice uh, and then no evasion for the dragon slayers so there is that these guys have impacts these guys don't uh, brutal impact obviously as well terrifying too these guys don't um, unstoppable you're going to pay 20 points for a banner uh, so overall on paper you might find these sort of comparable but in in reality the drake is just a much more effective piece it's very aggressively priced uh, what you probably want to do if you're parabellum and you're trying to balance the game a bit is you should either bring the uh, points cost of the ironclad drake up a little bit very slightly and bring the dragon slayers down a little bit if you want to see them uh, being used i think that there is uh, something to be said for them if you're running the Ardent Krieg with the, the uh, Kerrig Warlord where these the, the command stands get plus plus attacks and if you um, if you happen to have um, or if you happen to have the thing where nearby command stands get the rerolls so friendly character and command stands with an eight get flurry so there is a sort of a case to be made if you're running the drake as well as the dragon slayers in a list where they get plus two attacks to their command stand and the dragon slayers are, are nearby to the drake they start you know getting some accumulated buffs there so there is a case to be made but overall they are a little bit too expensive right 
Okay, but the rag, he is something that I do use in my games and would continue to use with this specific setup. The initiates, they do the job of the thanes um, more cheaply and the whole job is just to stay alive and just to tank for a bit and get the rag uh, swinging with his dragobrud and fueled by the furnace. That's the, uh, that's the setup that I would go for really. Over here, there are a few other things. Uh, Crown of Akshelod, uh, Burnout. I mean, I guess you could take lots of initiates or lots of... Um, um, I'm thinking of champion swords, actually, where you have lots of stands, you get plus two attacks. So if you can actually get that in there with Dragobrud, I think you'd probably have to have a long lineage. But, um, yeah, I don't know if he's allowed to have two masteries. So it's either long lineage or fueled uh, by the furnace. So I think I'd just go for fueled by the furnace, uh, honestly. Few other little banners here, hardened. Yep, I mean you'd you'd, you'd be taking these items instead of uh, one of these two, and I don't really recommend that. I think that most factions need their um, their items overhauled, and Dwegum is uh, an example of that. So let's just shut down the the rag for a moment and go to the tempered sorcerer. This is by far the best uh, best character that you can take with Dwegum. It has been overpowered for a really long time, and has been continually nerfed for. Um, you know, a really long time as well, just constantly nerfed. And it's still really powerful. When you take the Sorcerer Warlord, you've got uh, two spells per turn. And the things, thing is that the spells are so goddamn strong. So with Fire School, which again has been nerfed, this is the, the most basic option here. Your main spells, Coruscation and Fireball, are 14 inches each, which is a really good long range. You know, you go play Sorcerer Kings, and Sorcerer Kings have a lot of interesting spells which are very sort of situational and miscellaneous and not much direct damage, whereas Dwegum are the true Sorcerers. They just blast you and they blast you and blast you, and they're just, it's like a gun battery. So as the Warlord, you can cast this one, which is Attunement 4. He starts at, um, at, 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 at Wizard 7, so that's 7 dice on 4s, and they just take a hit from 14 inches away, and then Resolve checks on those hits. Fireball is even better. It's only Attunement 3, but the Armor Piercing 2 is extremely useful. So as the Warlord, you're just casting 1 Coruscation, 1 Fireball per turn as soon as they come in range. Very, very strong. Flame Wall used to be an absolutely oppressively, uh, oppressively powerful, um, ability but they've nerfed it into the ground now so it's got a very short range and um, casting three successes and stopping them use, use inspired uh, as a result of a charge it's just very situational and it just doesn't really come up so looking through the stats now he also has a gun that makes him um, very dangerous if he's on top of that Hellbringer Drake, which he often is, it's the same range as the Drake, so whenever you're shooting, the Drake sort of gets this little side gun from the Tempered Sorcerer, which is very, very strong. Elemental Potency, obviously we know what that does from the, the tokens. He's not a really good fighter, but that's not really his job. The main stat there is Volley 3, just to make his gun really, really impressive, right? With the spells, uh, Magma School is the other thing which is becoming really, really popular at the moment, and some people prefer the Magma option over the Fire option, and I can see why. I think it definitely is very viable if you're running a Tempered Sorcerer Warlord, and then you have a secondary Tempered Sorcerer in your list. So what happens there is that the Tempered Sorcerer Warlord casts this spell Eruption. So within 8 inches, you put down this little zone, okay? Now, um, after you've done that, with your second spell, you cast Magmatic... Um, sorry, I didn't mean to say Eruption. What I meant to say is you start by casting Magmatic Seep, so to create the zone with, with Erupting Zonal Terrain, then you cast Pyroclast, and it's got a very long range because the, the central point of the Magmatic Seep is 18 inches away from your model, and then... Um, the the diameter or the radius really is three inches so so long as you then cast pyroclast from the edge of that circle if you if you cast the magmatic seep eight inches away to the middle of it another three inches from the radius of that zone you've effectively got a point 11 inches away and then from that point you've got another eight inches on the pyroclast because it can be um sorry it can target, target, target an enemy within five inches of an erupting zone so what i'm trying to tell you sorry i'm talking so fast here is eight inches from the magmatic seep, three inches from the radius of that 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 zone, and then five inches of the pyroclast, effectively is giving you what? Eight plus three is eleven plus eight, uh, five is sixteen. Quite a long range for hitting them, and they'll take four hits uh, with unpiercing one. 
and it counts as being from the flank. So that is quite a long range spell. The good thing about magma also is that because you're trying to build up the tokens for elemental potency, you don't have to have an enemy uh, regiment in range. So with the fire school, you can't actually cast any spells if you if there's nothing within 14 inches of you. So in the early part of the game, you're not generating any tokens. Whereas the magma sorcerer comes onto the table, cast mag magmatic seep straight away, gets a token even though it's not affecting the game, and then in later turns, magmatic seep plus pyroclast, etc. Uh, so what you're doing there is you're setting up the the template, then casting the damage spell, and then when your next sorcerer activates, it can also use that same magmatic seep erupting terrain template to cast the pyroclast hits so you're once you get the ball rolling you're pumping out eight hits per turn on enemy troops and the number of successes you roll so long as you get their spell to work uh, doesn't really matter so you don't really need to give your sorcerers any upgrades and that's that's another really cool thing about about magma Another little little point here too is that if you have troops which have the officer uh, Herald of Magma, so they've got Ore of Death and the zone that they're, um, they're inside of counts as erupting. So if you happen to have some zone terrain on the table and you put your regiment there, your uh, sorcerers can start to go with uh, the Pyroclast straight away because um, you know, you've got a erupting piece of zonal terrain uh, that you can trigger the spell from, which is really, really cool. So Magma, very, very strong. Earth School, I, I want to like it. I've tried it. It's got some really cool spells in there. Uh, let's go through them. Uh, this is overall not a great school compared to the other ones, but we'll talk about it anyway. So Roots of Stone allows you to cast a spell on a, on a regiment that hasn't activated yet. So it gives you plus two defense, very good against enemy shooting, but also if you cast it into a combat and it's uh, and neither side has activated their troops, your troops aren't going to be moving anywhere because they're fighting in close combat anyway and your opponent then attacks them, you've got plus two defense. So let's say you've got a group of Steel Forged engaged with an enemy unit of, I don't know, Varangian Guard, and you activate your Earth Sorcerer first, you give your Steel Forged uh, defense six. So the Varangian Guard can then drop them down to, to two, to four, or to three, and you can sort of keep them alive in that way. That's very, very strong. But you can also cast it on an enemy regiment to stop them from moving when it's their turn to activate, which could be absolutely clutch. Let's say they've got their Fallen Divinity, which is about to charge into the zone and score points and it's tier three and it's about to wreck face but your sneaky little earth sorcerer casts roots of stone on it and it has to waste an entire turn doing nothing which could be game winning broken ground um hilariously says target regiment cannot perform impact hits on its next charge it doesn't say anything about that expiring at the end of the round which means that if they've got their massive unit of household knights and they've got like five of them plus the noble lord with glorious charge from Oliphant's Roar and then the noble lord's supremacy ability and yada yada. If you sneak up with your, um, your earth sorcerer and cast this on them, they are not going to get impact hits ever throughout the game unless they successfully charge something to remove the spell and then charge something else later on which is ridiculous very situational but could be very, very powerful and the third one giving your friendly unit tenacious that is very useful tenacious is always very good um, if you have hair or stone which you're unlikely to have but if you really do have it then you've got indomitable as well the good thing about rock shaping is that you can cast it at any time on any of your friendly units to um, just get a, 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 an extra token elemental potency uh, token right overall though because these spells are situational and they're going to be some turns where you don't get max value uh, compared to something like fire school where so long as the game has sort of reached turn three and there's going to be something in range at all times you know fire school is just delivering awesome value like hits at arm piercing two every single turn and that's why unfortunately earth school just can't beat that right now i've tried it i want to like it but sadly, it's a bit lopsided, and that, that does need a, need a change, in my opinion. Okay? So your Sorcerer um, could be on foot with some Fireforged or some Ballista, for, for example, or on top of a Hellbringer Drake. Having one Sorcerer on a Hellbringer Drake is a very popular choice because it's only five points, and it allows you to keep that uh, Sorcerer very safe. It's kind of hard to kill him when he's on that Drake and he's just camped behind your own troops. The Drake makes him size two, so he can see over friendly units for spells and for his gun. The other thing about that setup is that when the Drake comes 
comes onto the table, it's so fast it can march seven times two, that's 14 inches, to get you into a range of your spell, sometimes at an angle your opponent wasn't expecting. So if your opponent wandered onto your side of the table with some some squires or some raptor riders and the drake and the sorcerer are, are yet to activate, you can like scream onto the board 14 inches, possibly from the reinforcement zone on the side, get them within range, and then absolutely obliterate them with two fireballs, well, a fireball and a coruscation, I'd, I should say. Or you could even march the Hellbringer seven inches onto the table, shoot with the Drake's main guns and the Sorcerer's smaller gun, and then fire the two spells. It's just so devastating. So that's why a lot of people use the Drake. You don't have to have all of your Sorcerers on Drakes, but it's a very, very good combo. Looking now at the relics, uh, the one relic that I like the most really on the uh, Warlord uh, Sorcerer is this one, Graft of Fire, because it says um, whenever you do a spell casting action, and that could be like for both of your, your spells in any given turn, you pass a morale check or you suffer a wound, but you get an extra dice. So it's going to take a long, di long time to whittle him down to one wound left. He starts with four wounds, and there's a 50% chance, because he's uh, resolved three, of, of suffering that wound. So if you think about it, you can afford to take about three wounds, and um, it would take six attempts to do those three wounds. So it's effectively six extra spell dice over a period of several turns where you go from being wizard seven to wizard eight. And those dice are going on shots where it's four to hit or it's three to hit on an AP two. So Graft of Fire being 15 points is really, really good on, on the Warlord in my, my view. You can't really go wrong with it. Just don't obviously uh, use that ability when he's down to one wound. Another uh, another ability which is very very strong on him is Chthonic Flame because that means that they reroll resolve checks from his spells and of course the spells do a lot of damage and cause a lot of re resolve checks. So you're up against like imagine like it's a unit of blooded or something and you're just trying to ping them off the table because they've got uh, an aberration to give them lethal demise. They're about to charge your fire forged, and uh, you decide to fire at them with the tempered sorcerer. They takes three wounds and then they're rolling those resolve checks. They've got to re-roll them from the spell and you hit them with another spell. It's really really painful. I don't uh, typically take this a lot. Particularly because um, Old Dominion are probably the most um, most problematic in the meta, really, um, along with I, I don't know what are, what are Dwegum's worst matchups at the moment. Probably Wadroon and Hundred Kingdoms, and maybe Old Dominion. I'm not hundred percent sure. I haven't really tested all that out. Maybe Spires, uh, but Chthonic Flame just doesn't work against Old Dominion at all because they don't take any resolve checks. So that is just something to be concerned about. There was another one here, Heart of the Mountain, which I think is interesting because once per game you you ignore spell interference and you get, obviously, a one extra attunement. If you're playing in a meta where you are up against Old Dominion and other Dwagon players and uh, Sorcerer Kings as well, this can be really, really powerful because you can have that one turn where the Warlord is uh, hitting with even more of the dice and ignoring their spell interference, which is huge. Uh, so the points that you're paying for that could be worth it. Is, it is pretty steep at 30 points, but you're definitely going to get value if it's on the Warlord. Everything else here, really a bit more combat focused and less likely to be useful for the Sorcerer. Okay, Masteries. Uh, focused is probably something we should talk about. Rerolling two dice per turn, that's pretty powerful. It can only be used once uh, in one spell casting action per activation, so you're not going to get it for, um, for both of your Warlord spells. But at 25 points, if he's not going to be on the Sorcerer, I guess you could consider it. Like, if you're taking a Warlord on foot in a group of Fireforged, for 25 points, you're effectively getting two extra dice um, per turn on one of your spells. So I would use that on the Attunement 3 Fireball for Armor Piercing 2. You're throwing seven dice at that. You are likely to get three or four misses. It's very rare that you're going to get six hits out of seven. So you're almost always going to get to use Focused. And the two extra dice throwing is going to get one more hit. So it's like one AP2 hit per turn for 25 points. Not terrible. And if you're going to get three or four spells off during the game I think that could probably be justified Lava Shots um, I, yeah 
because there's so many other things you're going to be taking, I, I doubt you're going to be using this. It's either going to be Hellbringer Sorcerer or Focused, but Lava Shots does give you precise shot with your gun. It's just not very impactful. That's the only thing. Everything else here is more about... Um, more about sort of taking stands and sort of surviving uh, in the midfield so you're not going to be be using that as much so yeah the tempered sorcerer very very expensive character he's been continued to be nerfed over time but he's still um one of the strongest characters in the game if not the most strongest character in the entire game of conquest last argument of kings his Warband is also extremely good, by the way. Uh, if you hadn't noticed, Fireforge, very strong. Hellbringer Drake, very strong. Uh, Automata, also a decent pick. They have nerfed it a little bit. But the Fireforge and the Hellbringer Strike, uh, Drake are just the, the two standout options uh, in that bunch. All right, let's now turn our attention to the Steel Shaper. I, I quite enjoy this guy. He can be a Warlord, or he can just be you know another character in your list. He does unlock a couple of things here. The Steel Forged, he's the only person that can take Steel Forged, and he's the only person who can ride on the new Stone Forge, which we'll get to later. His Warlord ability, Ferric Embrace, is really interesting because it means that after you've resolved the uh, the action where you're using Elemental Potency, you then heal for one wound um, for everything you, sp you spent. So this can get, get a little bit confusing. Uh, what, the way it works is, let's say your opponent attacks you and scores 10 hits. Let's say it's your Fireforged. Your Fireforged has been hit 10 times, and uh, it's by something which has got cleave 2, so you're down to defense 2. If you spend 5 potency markers, which is your maximum, that means you only take 5 armor saves from that. So you roll your 5 saves, and you're at defense 2 here, and you only pass one of them, and you've now taken 4 wounds which has left one Fireforge stand on one wound left, because they've got five wounds. You then heal one wound for every marker that you spent to a maximum of three. So you spent five, but the markers are maxed out at three. So your Fireforge, having been reduced down to one wound left, will heal back three wounds. So now they've only been wounded once. They've sustained one wound total after all of that. Having said that, if they fail any resolve checks, so in that same example, taking four wounds, they also take four resolve checks. Let's say they fail all of them, right? That means that you lose a stand, and then you've got a couple of wounds inflicted on the, the next stand. The three wounds are going to heal that stand back up to full, right? So you might need a pen and paper to work that out, and you might need to play a couple of practice games, but the the overall takeaway from that is that your army becomes a little bit more attrition-focused with the Steel Shaper. You are a bit more survivable because you're, you're healing back in important situations, but what you want to do with this ability is try to calculate whether or not you're going to be bringing back a stand or just topping up the wounds on a stand. When it comes to healing, if you are not able to heal back at least 50% of that stand's wounds, it will not come back at all. So let's pretend that you've got a unit of Fireforged, which is reduced by one stand. You've lost one stand from that attack, and you've only spent two tokens. So you can now heal two wounds, but the two wounds won't be enough to bring back that stand because they've got five wounds each. You'd need three or more to bring back a stand. So if you think that it's going to resolve itself that way, maybe don't spend the tokens. Uh, but again, it's just such a useful ability on so many of your units because you are very tanky and survivable you might need to take a couple of wounds at a time you can actually heal back so you've got you've actually survived more than you even took so let's imagine an example where you're steel forged get hit three times by something which has cleave three so they have five wounds each they are defense four uh, but they're saving on ones and they've already lost a stand so if you spend just three tokens, you're blocking all of the damage because they did three hits. You spend the tokens, you block all three of them, and then you calculate the healing. So because you've already lost a stand, your, your dead stand effectively heals three wounds out of the five that it started with, which is more than half. So you bring that Steel Forge back on the table. So your opponent could actually give you an opportunity to like gain wounds just by attacking you in certain situations, which makes it really, really strong. The reason why I feel like he's still not the best warlord in the army is because, you know, the sorcerer is so incredibly strong and it's better to be aggressive than just taking the hits and just trying to, try to be defensive. 
So there is just such a disparity there. But um, if you want to try this guy out, he is really, really cool. And there may be some builds that I haven't really thought of that that uh, that really make him worth it. When it comes to monsters, they're especially good at using the tokens because they're always going to get the healing out of it. And if we try out the new uh, stone forged over here, which is soon to be released... It has 20 wounds, uh, uh, defense 3. And the thing about Magnetic con Conduit here is that uh, it can spend some of the markers itself and get attacks and so forth. So this is something which is going to be um, really making use of those tokens, which is why the Steel Shaper riding it uh, as the Warlord could be a really interesting choice. So 10 points for Fairy Throne, mounts up on the Stone Forged, and if it's the Warlord, uh, you could be doing quite well there with your um, with your Stone Forged. Uh, with him supporting it really because again he's got some of these other really cool things here plus one clash so the hone um, hone blades onto the sky will make him clash four he can get blessed by the way uh, unmake armor so minus one defense to them when he attacks them with his 10 attacks again he can get blessed and he can get additional attacks here for um from magnetic conduit and then Temper Plate, uh, giving him Hardened is really, really good too. He does get Hardened against shooting, which is really, really nice. But um, Hardened against close combat attacks is, is really good too. So if you're fighting something with Cleave 1 and he's starting out Defense 3, you having Hardened 1 there is really, really nice. So it not, it's not bad. Like I would definitely consider this guy being the Warlord if I'm running him on a Stoneforged in particular. I don't really use a lot of other items on him. I think that Memory of Breath could be a good one if he's joining a unit of Magma Forged, which are the new guys with Aura of Death and Lethal Demise. He just doesn't really need much help in terms of spell casting, and he's not a particularly good combat character to begin with. He's got a he's got a weird rule called Indifferent Towards Life, which means that he can't give his resolve to a uh, a friendly unit. So you don't really want him as a um, a guy that's leading a unit of Hold Warriors in the front ranks, for example, and he doesn't. Really do duels critical field means that he automatically passes his spell when casting it on his own regiment or something which is directly in combat with his own regiment so very very reliable there and he's got a got a little gun there of course as well so i personally run him in the fireforge because his gun will complement their guns um he wants to stay away from combat once they do get into combat though the the hone blades definitely helpful to take them the clash uh, two to clash three or if you're up against the enemy shooting like having hardened or something like that's really good and his spells always automatically work in the fire forged that's really really a, a good combo i suppose you could consider uh, if you're not going to be riding a stone forge to give him a lava shots for just 10, 10 points if you've got a step spare 10 points that could be helpful so his warband just has the, the basics mainstay here. Uh, he does have access to Magma Forged, which are really interesting. I'm strongly considering getting some of them when they come out. Uh, they're a really interesting unit. They are uh, costly, but not completely breaking the bank. And if you're, if you're sufficiently supporting them i think they can be worth it like if you if you think about the fact that they can have a character to give them clash four or harden one for example or the enemy's minus one defense think about this so unmake armor on a unit that's defense three they go down defense two then they activate and the magma forged are causing aura of death two that is a powerful combo especially if he has memory of breath to give plus one aura of death so you've got say three magma forged up the front there that takes them to aura of death three they're going to take nine hits at minus one defense that starts to become quite powerful and if they do attack your magma forged the minus one defense that they've suffered is going to affect them for lethal demise as well because they're taking one uh one hit for every wound they do to the magma forge in close combat quite a good combo so the tempered steel shaper is a really good choice for the magma forged uh we can talk, talk about using the carowig with them as well but i think the steel shaper is, is great to, for them to be honest and uh yeah not 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 a bad idea to take a bigger unit of them especially if this guy is your warlord so let's say we t we, we break the bag we take five of them and we put the we put the steel shaper in with a stone forged so instead of riding the uh, riding the throne, he's just going to be up front there with a uh, little uh, little memory of breath here to give them aura of death. So that kind of combo means that uh, they're going to be quite hard to kill. The, the base defense four, resolve five, very very solid. And as you start to spend the the elemental potency tokens, they are healing back, and that become becomes a way to just completely lock down one side of the table, uh, one flank where you have one large zone you're trying to capture. Very very useful. Okay. 
So that's about it for the the characters. I, I will see if I can just move through and talk about some of the regiments a little bit. Um, what else have we got here? I might just go back home and go browse factions. And we'll go view faction here. I've I've sort of been talking about the the regiments uh, a fair bit during this overall commentary. I'll just see if there's anything else to say really about dragon slayers and everything below that. So, dragon slayers just a little bit overcautious at the moment. They one of the earliest. Uh, in, uh, infantry units ever conceived of by Parabellum for this game and the power creeper sort of left them a lot uh, behind a little bit on paper they look amazing don't they cleave three and harden two on the same regiment and feed hunter means they're just going to absolutely slap down a monster if they come into combat with it the problem is though that they're kind of slow kind of predictable and you've got to pay a lot for this um, I remember fighting against a Hephaestion, which had uh, Cleave 3. That was blocked mostly by Harden, but at, at starting at Defense 3, coming down to Defense 2, they still took a lot of damage, and they're not fearless, despite being uh, Fiend Hunters, and they, they, they slay dragons. That's what they do. They in, in the lore, they're very much against those big beasts, but they're apparently afraid of them. Resolve 4 is great, but if you're up against Terrifying 2, they are going to run away, which um, I don't think is right. So yeah, um, if your opponent is, is shooting at them with a lot of a lot of hits from whatever it might be, um, also there are Wadroon units which ignore Harden for shooting. They're going to suffer against that. And being in the same warband as that Ironclad Drake um, means that they're kind of a little bit maligned. I love the miniatures. I really enjoyed painting them. Uh, I do think that they uh, they have potential. It's just that. In terms of internal balance, the other options you can take and the overall cost of them at the moment, they are a little bit in need of a, a buff, in my view. Fireforged, uh, extremely strong. Uh, these guys, I guess the weakness they have is that they are a little bit costly. They can force you to make cuts elsewhere in your army. They're obviously not very good in close combat at attacks three. But the way to play them is to set them up next to your main infantry block of initiates or thanes or whatever you might be running and try to get your opponent attacking that combat unit so that you can shoot the fire forged into the close combat and at that point they become absolutely devastating. Um, volley 2 is not great but if you can aim they've got decent range at range 14 barrage 4 is amazing armor 2 is the real standout um, standout stat here even if they do get into close combat you know defense 3 and a shield most close combat units sorry most uh, range units don't have that kind of defense wounds 5 resolve 3 as well is, is just good for keeping them alive so if your opponent gets shot at and maybe one or two stands of knights or something makes it to your fire forge you can still fight your way out of that close combat Especially if you've got a Steel Shaper there for his spells to to affect the, the Fire Forged. And like, yeah, again, if it's just like one unit, one stand of Bone Golems that made it in combat with the Fire Forged, the Defense 4 is so useful against Aura of Death and his attacks, obviously, and you might be able to grind him down and break free. The Officers, they are expensive. Like, Torrential Fire is absolutely extremely brutal. Like, I, I think I would take this if I was running a, a big mob of, like, four or five stands of Fire Forge. I typically don't do that, but if I was, I would consider the Flamecaster. And Herald of Fire, you're, you're unlikely to be using these guys in close combat. You want to avoid close combat, so I think Herald of Fire, probably not the best choice unless you have some other strat up your sleeve. Flame Berserkers, we talked about them. They are a very useful unit. You should use them if you're running the Kerouac in your list. Uh, they're very fast, they're very hitty, and they, they combo well with the Kerouac spells, that's for sure. So uh, definitely a strong unit. Hellbringer Drake, this is uh, a unit you can run with a Sorcerer riding it or without it. They updated Overcharge so that it always gets the token as a draw event regardless of whether the character's on it. So this overcharge marker gives you plus two barrage and armor piercing plus one. You can't get more than um, 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 armor piercing two. You're almost always using this token as soon as you gain it. But there could be a game where you're moving around the table and you're saving up overcharge markers and then finally after one or two turns of saving, you get plus six barrage or something crazy like that. And that's uh, quite a good way of like stopping, stocking up the potential of the Drake uh, when it doesn't have an opportunity to shoot every single turn. Most games it's going to be shooting every single turn. But the way to use the Drake is to hang out behind a regiment that is going to be tough in combat like Initiate for example so the initiates move up the drake goes right behind them or behind the, the fire forged i usually have a little triangle with the initiates at front fire forged next to them to shoot into combat with them the drake behind those two units and the drake with size two can shoot directly over them and just can't be tied up in close combat preferably with a sorcerer on top you've got that holy 
quadruple threat kill zone with with this uh, this setup, and it's um it's it's very uh, very uh, intimidating. The gun isn't actually even like the only thing that this guy has going for it. The gun, if you think about it, uh, at volley two is is going to miss most of its shots. Uh, armor piercing one's nice. The range is nice. Barrage ten, it's not really like pumping out the same amount of shots as a regiment would. Like if a normal regiment of archers might be like three or four barrage uh, for three stands, and that actually shoots more than the drake. But the drake is something which doesn't diminish in in firepower potential as it takes wounds. So it starts with 14 wounds. If you reduce it to like four wounds left, it's still popping out the same amount of shooting. Whereas if you have a unit of Karaitids and they lose a stand from enemy units shooting at them, their potential is reduced. That doesn't happen when your monster is, is shooting. So that's, that's awesome. And the last thing I really love about this thing is the fact that you can actually double march at 14 inches, which is a long way to jump onto a zone and protect a zone and contest it and beat up on that like one unit or like one stand of legionnaires that's just camping it if you double march over it and do some impact on it and uh, and kill it in the following turn in close combat the drake can do that but most other sort of shooting units can't achieve that and that's what makes the drake a uh, really really useful piece the ballistae um i wish uh Dwegum had a slightly less expensive shooting option but the Ballistae are still a, a good regiment because they have great range and armor piercing one. A lot of uh, a lot of shooting units don't have access to armor piercing, which is a very important benefit. So great at sort of picking off those legionnaires which are creeping onto the enemy zone. They're also quite useful at uh, surviving a bit of a shootout against an other shooting unit. So if you're being shot at by their rangers or hunter cadre or whatever, starting with defense two and having a shield makes them more appropriate for that. But at 140 points, uh, yeah, a little little bit expensive you typically wouldn't really want to be taking any of these office offices there either some people like herald of magma but you kind of want to stay away from close combat with them uh, but yeah they are a cheaper option than some of the other things you can take in dwegum for unlocking a, a, a restricted unit so the thanes as we talked about they are they are very costly 200 points just for three stands uh, they don't uh, really get a lot done in close combat. Class 3 attacks 4, cleave 1. It's kind of average these days for an elite heavy unit. Uh, they, more than anything, would be wanting to bodyguard the Rag to do most of the damage there and for the uh, Rag to give them flank. But they are kind of slow, so I, I feel like they need a bit of a points decrease to really make it onto my radar. The Warriors are possibly one of the least interesting units in this faction, one of the weakest. I really prefer initiates because the initiates get to defense four over the warriors being three and the initiates have support so they can pump out more attacks in the long run uh, and they're, they're also attacks to cl uh, uh, clash sorry also attacks for clash two same as the the warriors so when you do this kind of comparison for an extra 15 points the ability to to survive longer and actually have more attacks going from the back is worth it even though you can't take the officers i typically find you don't really need them so um i really prefer the initiates the hold warriors i guess if you're just going for an absolute cheap way of unlocking a, a restricted unit they are slightly better than than uh initiates if you're only going for a minimum small unit of just three like if the initiates are not going to get the value of their iron discipline or their support attacks the hold warriors are fine and uh they have the option for the exemplar which i quite like giving them more resolve plus two attacks to the command stand if i have a spare 15 points on my list i sometimes take that and uh, these other officers can be relevant on the hold warriors especially if you're taking a big unit of hold warriors for some reason that's when you'd consider these so the automata they were so strong like a year ago they did have to get nerfed they used to be like movement eight and they used to be a little bit stronger in close combat they have been nerfed down a little bit but they're still very very useful and there's something that makes dwegum an interesting faction like you think of dwegum as just this uh, faction which plants down the super hard infantry blocks that all the same like you compare thanes and warriors and initiates and and, and magma forged and dragon slayers they all feel very similar like they're just this blocky unit which camps the zone the automata are different they've got fluid formation they're very fast 
past. They've got Aura of Death, Impact Hits, and Irregular. They're a very different unit, and I'm so grateful for that. I wish like they were designed Dwegum in such a way that they have more outlandish units. Like They could take a page out of Warhammer, the old classic Fantasy Battles book, and make a gyrocopter, like a little flying buzzy thing that has zips around the battlefield, because it just contrasts so much with the way that Dweg normally play. So I love Inferno Automata for that reason. They're a harassment unit. They're a great unit for just running into the, a forest in the middle of the table and then march charging an enemy range unit once they appear and just getting in the way of things, uh, just causing some disruption. And it, th that sort of play means that your opponent is not sort of coming directly over the battlefield as fast as they can to tie up your gun line in close combat and beat you um, up close where they may have an advantage. So uh, Automata just great at disrupting that. Initiates, we just talked about them. Uh, again, this is a unit which I think is really solid. I take a big mob of five of them with either a Rag or a Ardent Kerouig. The Drake, uh, the the newer monster, really, uh, very, very strong. It's just he, he doesn't quite have the stats that the Dragon Slayers do, but the mobility of him and the ability to just get impact hits and zip around the battlefield and, and threaten things from a longer distance makes him so powerful. He is unstoppable naturally. You don't have to pay 20 points for a banner in his case. Uh, just insane value. Just don't put the rag on top of him until that rules gets fixed. Magma Forge, we talked about them briefly. They can be taken with the uh, the Kerouig, I believe, or, or, or one of the other characters, but I think the Steel Shaper is a really cool option for them, to be honest with you. Um, when the spells start stacking with the things you can do in the, in the minus one defense, as I mentioned earlier, really, really cool. So I may, I may be tempted to pick up a couple of boxes of them. Steel Forge used to be uh, overpowered. They used to be defense five, and they were really terrorizing a lot of battlefields at that time. They got uh, knocked back to defense four. Flux Powered is their main thing, and you can get plus two clash or plus two attacks. I feel like this is poorly designed. I think they should uh, overhaul this unit to keep the plus two clash, but instead of plus two attacks being the option, uh, it should be plus one movement and plus one impact hits as the alternative, because then sometimes you wouldn't take plus two clash. Like there might be some scenarios in which you need the speed uh, and you're not going to be doing any fighting, so you have the alternative. And that could make uh, for situations where you actually have to think and use your brain and uh, you know, put a little bit of strategy into it, use use a bit of tactics there. At the moment, all they do is they just get plus two attacks, as plus two clash, I should say, every single activation, and they, they just ride on that, and they go all in on that. So you march charge, you've got six impact hits on fives, that's great, and when they start attacking, let's say you're clash five with inspired, that's 13 attacks, four times three plus the leader. 13 attacks on fives with three rolling sixes, they almost always get 13 exact hits with cleave one, and that's their strength. I think they're a really, really good unit, but the flux powered thing, I, that needs to be reworked. It just makes no sense. The only time I would possibly consider plus two attacks is if I was up against something which had um, like so many wounds that I needed to inflict. Like if, if it had 14 wounds left and I would win the game if I do exactly 14 wounds and I lose the game if I don't do 14 wounds, then uh, you know you might consider the attacks just in case you roll an absolutely astronomically good roll and you succeed in all of them and your opponent fails every defense roll and you manage to get that through. That could be one option for, for additional attacks, I suppose. Yeah, um, I, I guess I suppose another another reason why you might take it is if you if you had hone blades from the steel shape to go to clash four and you're going to be inspiring. Uh, the math of it does work out to be slightly better than um, just Inspire Clash with the, the additional Clash there because there's, you know, the difference between uh, Clash 5 and, and Clash 6 is not really relevant, but um, the difference between uh, Clash 3 and 4 with Inspired when you have extra attacks does make a difference, so I suppose there's that. The Stoneforged, really interesting new character, new, new beast. This is a great big monster. It used to be a unit. They, they, re, they reworked it. Um, some weaknesses of this thing, I suppose, is that at 10 attacks, you're not really getting a lot done. Uh, so it really is just like a, a road bump, really. It's just like a, like a tar pit. Magnetic Conduit is really interesting. Uh, three, elemental, uh, three elemental potency markers. One attacks each, so you kind of want to play this in a list where you've got four spellcasters for lots of um, of these markers. So that gives you 13 attacks, 
he does he does count as being bigger for scoring, so that's kind of nice. 13 attacks at Cleave 3. If you can get Hone Blades on him, that's Clash 4 with Inspired. That's pretty cool. Unstable Alloys allows him to be hardened to against shooting. I think that's really cool. And uh, also makes Spellcasters have a harder time against him. So yeah, I think if you're going up against another Dwagon player and they've got like Fireforged or something, uh, a Stoneforged uh, is a really good uh, way to sort of break the tie as it were um kind of interesting in interested in picking one up i kind of like the model but i'm not too sure how useful it will be in combat we'll see i think it really does need the the steel shaper and lastly we have wardens wardens are one unit which are a little bit weak in the meta at the moment they are something which you take with the ardent kerouac and they're something i'd really only consider is if i'm just playing a bit of a meme list and i'm trying out the tempered uh, sorry not the uh, the ardent creed is what i want to say there to get the the bonus attacks for the command stand they are a bit faster than your normal dwarves at uh, movement six uh, attack six is nice cleave one nice devout that's something which really plays into the kerouac's ability you could put the Karo eggs with them. I feel like the Karo eggs better with the um, the Flame Berserkers because of Rancor. So at 190 points, yeah, it's kind of hard to justify them. I think that they are a unit which is waiting for a bit of a buff to Ardent Creed or a bit of a points decrease because there are a lot of other things in the faction which are uh, sort of quite strong for them, strong compared to them right now. All right, guys, we're just about to conclude the faction run through. I'm just going to show you guys a couple of um, sample lists, really. How would I build Wickham, right? Tempered Sorcerer, Warlord, and the Fireforged, and the Hellbringer Drake. So if he's the Warlord, he's obviously going to take Magma because we're going to take more than one Warlord. And for the Relics, I think we want to go not for Graf to Fire because he doesn't need it when he's playing Magma. Masteries, Hellbringer Sorcerer, Hellbring Sorcerer Mount, like that. If you're playing Magma School, I don't really feel like you need any relics at all. We could also take a unit of Bliste and uh, some Automata there to fill out his Warband, and then we want uh, an entirely new Sorcerer, I suppose. And the other Sorcerer could go in the Fireforged and jump. Um, I guess we could have a second Hellbring Drake. This is one way to play them. We take Magma School over here, that's all done. And then we take the. Uh, let's say the Kerouig over here for some Flame Berserkers. He's going to jump in the Flame Berserkers with his uh, with, with Rancor, so we're going to give him flame, Flaming Oratory, and we're going to give them even more uh, Aura of Death hits with Memory of Breath. And then uh, as a follow-up over here, we could take a second unit, and that gives us... Um, we're not actually allowed to take more than two because of this special rule here, so no more than two regiments like that. This is already looking really, really good. Um, we may need a little bit more scoring. Like the, the problem with this list is we don't really have an anvil unit. So the other way you can go here is you can drop that out and put the initiates in instead and you take a massive unit of, of initiates. So uh, over here, we don't really need memory of breath so much because he's, he's not gonna go into the flame berserkers in this version. Uh, what you would need though is the uh, standard bearer like that. And uh, we've got 20 points there, which we could use to put in some kind of, um, some sort of weapon, I suppose. I can't really see myself uh, putting any weapon in there on him. He doesn't really need it. Um, so you've got that, that, that option. I suppose another sort of route you could go here is to, to take away Magma School. Like if we're not going to go Magma School, he could go with Fire School. And then you put the Graft of Fire in on this guy. So that, as I said, he's going to cut himself once per turn, get an additional dice, regardless of whether he uh, succeeds or fails. And then you've spent your allocation of points. And uh, this is the kind of list that I like to play, where you've got this Kerouig with the initiates and a big mob, and he's able to keep them alive with Flaming Oratory and all of the tokens you're gener generating from your characters. The Flame Berserkers go out in front of him, he casts Rancor on them uh, in the second turn. And then you've got so much in the way of guns over here, two Fireforged, one Balliste, two Drakes, and three Fireballs a turn effectively, one Coruscation, two Fireballs. This is an absolutely nasty, nasty, nasty Dwegum list, right? Let's go again. Let's uh, look at another way you could sort of play, which is the Steel Shaper. Let's grab the Fire Forge. Let's grab the Stone Forged. So we're going to put the Steel Shaper as the Warlord. He's going to be Ferric Throne, and he's going to jump onto the Stone Forged here. And in terms of relics, I don't really know if I want to include anything, to be honest. 
then uh, you want to really just take a lot of spellcasters. So we're going to go jump to the sorcerer again. He's going to take the fireforged and the uh, ballista and the drake. In fact, we're going to cut out the fireforged there. We're just going to put him onto the hellbringer drake, and uh, we will go for. Uh, fire school here, okay, brilliant. Then we're gonna take another sorcerer and we're gonna put this guy with the fire forge and we're gonna take some automata. And let's just for a, a lols joke, let's take earth school. The thing here is that with earth, he might be able to put uh, roots of stone onto the uh, the stone forge hilariously or um, just put tenacious onto him or just something which is gonna be helpful. And then lastly, we take the, uh, the carawig so that you can have the berserkers the cool thing about this sort of list is that you're pumping out tons and tons of spells and in fact you could actually make the berserkers a, uh, a little bit bit bigger if you wanted to or go back to the initiates so the idea here is you've got four spellcasters so you're going to be hopefully generating four tokens per turn and the stoneforge is going to love that for just really um eating up those tokens for when he he, he really sort of um does a lot of work in the midfield and camps and then you've got a lot of guns to shoot at whatever the stoneforge is fighting to sort of break him out of combat I think the third list we'll just briefly touch on would be um, the Ardent list where you go for the Kerouac and you take um, some Berserkers, some more Berserkers, some Wardens and some Wardens and you make this guy the Warlord. So now every command stand is getting plus two attacks which is why you want to take as many combat uh, units as possibly can. They're all going to get banners uh, because you want to be charging and this is where you're just going to be swamping your opponent with uh, units that actually do quite a lot of attacks. Then you grab the Rag, you grab the Initiates, Take about six initiates with the standard bearer because the, the rags attacks are important here. So he's going to grab Dragobrog. We want to get the masteries, unfuel the furnace, and then we're going to take uh, one Dragon Slayers, one Ironclad Drake, and one um, Ballista just to get the points up. The Dragon Slayers are then going to get um, a bonus stand. They're going to take the standard bearer and they're going to take the Nemancer apprentice. So these guys hit really hard with four stands. And if you keep the Drake near, nearby, you've got this ability to have flurry on the command stand. So Dragon Slayers are normally attacks five, plus one for the leader is six, plus two for the Kerouac's Righteous Annihilation is eight. So that eight attack um, group there is going to have flurry. And if your opponent is dumb enough to accept a, a duel, obviously, they um, will get wrecked by that one Dragon Slayer a command stand. If they decline, they suffer all the usual negative effects of re re refusing a duel. So that that's kind of use, useful. Having Fearless as well is very good in the Dragon, dragon Slayers because they don't have it otherwise. But yeah, if you're in combat with an enemy unit which has a character, uh, you're going to stop them scoring and you're going to force them to re reroll ones on resolve checks. Uh, with that duel being declined. So imagine you're fighting against some Avatara with a Lineage Highborn. If they accept the duel, you've got eight attacks with Flurry and Cleave three, which will probably kill their Highborn, to be honest. And if the Highborn declines, as it probably should, then the entire unit of Avatara are rerolling ones on resolve checks, so that's kind of handy. This list overall isn't um, particularly strong, in my opinion, but it's fun. Like, it's a different way of playing Dwegum, and I hope that it continues to get buffed, because it's, honestly, it's just really cool, right? Put relics in there, memory of breath. We really should find points for... Um, um, for flaming or oratory like we can drop maybe one unit of initiates or something like that and, and get there but this is another way to play uh dwegum gosh been talking very fast for about an hour now hope you guys enjoyed this little uh, foray into the dwarves they're a pretty cool faction and um, they have some work to do to make their some of the mechanics more interesting but they are very powerful so if you like if you like winning if you like bullying people on the tabletop and doing well at, at tournaments this is a decent decent faction to go with they have been nerfed over the over the last year but they can still hold their own against the top dogs in my view and against some of the weaker factions out there they absolutely crush so good luck there with your games, uh, show me some pics of your army, and uh, leave me a like, subscribe, and a comment. Thanks very much.